Hello everyone and we are so glad that you could join us today as we look at the second Sunday of Advent. And for those of you that are in neighborhood churches that are peppered around Richmond Hill, you have already had a chance to experience that second reading of uh, Advent that we are sharing as a church family. And so if you're just joining us and you have no idea what's happening or what the connection is with RHCC and Advent, just gonna invite you uh, to click on the post down below and we've posted our reading there for Advent Sunday. We're not doing it uh, online. We're actually doing it uh, at a participatory level in our neighborhood churches. And so uh, that has already happened and we are joining in now after some beautiful worship. We're joining in now for time in the word. And so you've joined us just in time for that. And we are so glad that you are here just to experience time in the word with our HCC and the journey that we are taking as we participate in Advent together. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I'm experiencing personally is the fact that there is significant weight to Advent for me this year. And I think that it has to do with the fact that so much is just continuing to happen in our world. I'm having so many conversations with people who are registering either for Christmas uh, assistance and toys or who have just come to our country under significant duress, who are carrying just very heavy, heavy things. And I find myself saying, come thou long expected Jesus. Our world is in need of a savior. And I think I am sensing that for myself more personally and more uh, for my community and for this community of Richmond Hill more than I've ever understood that before. There is a weight and we are in need of a savior. Well, this year together, RHCC, we are looking into what it means to experience expectant joy. And so that is our reality. What are we expecting this year as we connect in with Christmas and with Advent? And last week as we were together, as we were gathered in one building and as we shared in worship, Tim talked about joy in the presence of his presence, right? So joy, sorry, in the promise of his presence. So we together can expect the promise of joy. And that's where we started our journey in Advent. Well, today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. And we're going to be talking about choices. Now, how many of you have already made several choices today? Oh my goodness. Uh, this week, I've had to make so many choices that it's been overwhelming. We make a lot of choices. And if we really thought about that, uh, it would definitely overwhelm us, right? I know I make choices, too many to count in a day, in a week, in a month, and I know you hear me when I say this. You know, they could be simple choices, right? Or they can be very complex choices. Our lives are literally chock full of choices. Okay, so just in case you haven't made enough today, we're gonna make some choices together. And so here we go, I've got some for you to either imagine in your mind or if you're with people, you can call them out and say what you would choose. So we're gonna play a little game of would you rather. All right, we do this all the time with our kids. Would you rather, so here comes the choices. Would you rather be forced to sing along or dance to every single song you hear? Would you rather lose your sight or your memory? Mm. Would you rather swim in a pool full of Nutella or a pool full of maple syrup? Would you rather wear the same socks for a month or the same underwear for a week. You can share if you're in a group of people. <laughs> Would you rather get a paper cut every time you turn the page 
or bite your tongue every time you eat. <laughs> now look, <laughs> all of those can be fairly trivial, maybe. Some are hard and some choices as we go from day to day, they can be very, very challenging and very difficult. It is always our responses though, our responses to the choices of life that really make all the difference in the world. Well, for our time today, as we look at the word, we are going to look into the experience of a woman who faced a significant choice. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture. And uh, actually, I'm not going to read it because I want you to read it in your neighborhood church. So let's pause for a minute. We're going to press pause right here. And whether you're alone in a space and you just want to open up your Bible and pause and read, or whether you are in neighborhood church and you're gathered with people, we're going to stop now and we're going to read the portion of scripture from Luke. Luke 1, beginning at verse 26. Read the word together. All right, welcome back. And I hope that you've engaged in reading the word aloud wherever you are. Well, the focus of our time today is the person of Mary and her encounter with angel Gabriel, where she received the word, where she received something quite significant, that she would be the one through whom which God's son would come into the world. Now, I really want to take a minute and pause for a moment and give some significant context to the environment at the time that she received this message from the angel Gabriel. And often in a place in our imagination, we, we look at this story and, and in our mind's eye, we think about the children's book that we've maybe read or the picture of Mary in, in blue and in white and the very simplistic and innocent nature by which she gives the response that we see in scripture. But here's what we know to be true at the time that this encounter took place. It's a time of dirt, of grit, and of the weight in which the context changes our understanding of this particular story and Mary's response. So in the ancient Near East, the nature of Mary's impending pregnancy would have been seen as highly questionable, suspicious, shameful, and scandalous. She was not, uh, she was not married. She was only engaged at this point of time. And so that had numerous effects upon her own personal life. You know, her pregnancy would have been viewed as an adulterous one in a culture where there was a potential for death if you were caught in adultery. That was the penalty. On top of that, she would have been uh, seen differently by her husband or by Joseph. You know, he could have disowned her and publicly denounced her for what was happening and for some uh, uh, impending adultery or suspected adultery. Add this to the environment in which she was living and the way that women were viewed. You know, they were not valued in any way. And the choice that Mary was faced was to consider all of these things. And it was incredibly risky for her maybe even a matter between life and death. And so it's in this environment that we find Mary face to face with God's messenger, the angel Gabriel. After assuring Mary of God's favor, after walking her through the fact that his presence was going to be with her, he proceeds to really dismantle everything that she knows to be true. Everything that is stable, everything that is dependable in the hostile world in which she lives, where her worth was dependent upon her status and her commitments. The worlds of God's messenger shifts everything. 
It changes everything. Verse 30 to 33, if you have your Bibles open, it says that he tells her that she will be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah. And we can't even begin to understand the weight of this statement. After she and her ancestors before her had waited thousands of years for the fulfillment of the words of the prophet, for freedom, it was finally happening. And she would be the key piece to this unfolding story. Every time that I pause to really read and to consider the weight of this incredible moment, I find myself absolutely speechless and in awe. And I've often wondered about the, the mad mix of emotions for Mary. I imagine the feelings that we probably all have imagined as we consider her story, the feelings of surprise, of wonder, of humility, and of honor. But as I consider the weight of the context by which all of this took place, I recognize the very deep level of potential fear, the unknown, the human reactions, the heaviness of social expectations and norms. But during all of this, I can imagine Mary's overwhelming joy. Her heart must have been overflowing with the culmination of joyful expectation. And although it is perhaps easy to get caught up in the miraculous nature of this encounter, the theology that's around it, everything that comes with this encounter, we must not forget that Mary, in her humanness, still had a choice to make. And, and so what do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. Together we believe that God, who has given every single one of us free will, we have the gift of choice. And Mary was a human like each and every one of us. And we may think that because this encounter was an essential part of God's plan for the redemption of the world, that Mary's acceptance of this plan for her life was a foregone conclusion. But the fact of the matter is that Mary was still free to exercise her God-given gift of free will. She very well could have chosen to say no. She could have considered the risks she could have considered the challenges. She could have let that overwhelm her senses. She could have considered the difficulty of the road less traveled and what that would mean for her. But for those of us who know this story and know it well, we know that she did not say yes, or sorry, she did not say no, but instead she said yes. And verse 38 says, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Choice. Even though perhaps she didn't understand fully and she didn't understand what it would all mean or how things were unfold, when she was presented with a choice, Mary chose to say yes, and Mary's response was to choose joy. And I would like to suggest today that that joy absolutely filled every area of her life. Now, how do I know this? Well, I know this because uh, we just need to look a few more chapters over, a few more verses over to 47. Have a look and we see Mary's rejoicing. Look at the first 
four verses, 46 to 49. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy. And he has done great things for me. I love the message paraphrase. And it puts it this way. And Mary said, I'm bursting with good news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. As I reflect on this scene, this whole scene, including Mary's song, including these words, I cannot help but think to myself that it's a story of choices. First of all, God chose Mary to bear the Messiah, an unsuspecting teenager and a humble servant. Secondly, Mary chose to say yes to what would not only be joy for her, but would ultimately be joy for the world. I want to say that again because I think that's important. Mary chose to say yes to what would not only be joy for her, but would ultimately be joy for the world. A world that had spent thousands of years bursting with joyful expectation. Now look, during this season of Advent, as I consider the choices that I make in my own heart and life, as, as we consider the choices that we make at a very deep level, I am significantly challenged by this encounter that Mary had. The complexity of her choices, her willing response. And for many of us, this has been a year of, of ridiculous challenge. <laughs> Maybe that's your reality today. Where, where we or where you have been forced to grit your teeth and continue in the midst of darkness, unfair expectations, and unexpected surprise. For many of us, we have been forced into things where we have taken the road less traveled and where the right way has been the hard way. For many of us, we have lost the familiar and perhaps God has even shifted what we know to be true and what we know to be comfortable. Instead, living in uncertain times with uncertain outcomes and uncertain reactions from the people around us. But we have been given an opportunity to choose. And the underlying work of the heart has been for us to trust and choose joy. As we consider Mary, there is transformation in choice. And I believe that more than ever, like Mary, God is asking me, will you, Krista, will you carry the transformative reality of my son with you into this world? Will you choose not only to receive joy, but will you choose to share joy? I'm challenged to always remember that although Christ's indwelling through the power of the Holy Spirit is the means for transformation in my own personal life, accepting the responsibility to share his gospel message can be the transformative power in the lives of others. I am willing to bet that the sacred moments that Mary spent with God's messenger that day and in the days 
And in the weeks to follow, she came to understand more fully what it would mean to carry the Savior of the world within her and also the responsibility that would be hers to eventually share him with others. For you see, she could not physically carry him forever. And the day would come when for Mary, the internal reality of Christ would become the external reality of Christ. Her personal joy would be the joy of the world. For us, what does that mean? As we consider ourselves choosing joy and sharing joy. Friends, we can choose to embrace and share joy. We can choose that even in the midst of our circumstances and the, the filth and the muck that we're trudging through. When we choose to embrace and share joy, our lives become a testament to the saving power of the God that we serve and can transform the lives of others. Let's do this choice together this Advent season. Come, thou long expected Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we are gathered in our neighborhood churches, or maybe as we are alone in our spaces, wherever we're finding ourselves, I would ask that you would meet us there. And God, may we recognize within ourselves that you have given us the choice. May we choose joy. May we not stop there then, Lord God, but may we share joy. God, our world is in need of a savior and we don't need to go very far to discover that for ourselves. Some of us are, are joining in today and we are broken. And we are feeling the weight of the world on our shoulders. God, may we choose joy. Some of us are, are looking at the headlines and, and looking at what's happening in the world around us and the unrest in the Ukraine, in, in Iran, in China, and we are saying, Lord God, we can't carry this anymore. May we choose joy. And may we share it with a hurting and dark world. God, illuminate our hearts, illuminate our spirits. May we see and experience you. Come, thou long expected Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Let's continue to reflect and worship together.